Welcome to Adventures in Accessibility, a podcast that explores the far reaches of disability, access, and inclusion with your host, Emily Schumann. Hi, everyone, and thanks again for joining us. Today's guest is Chai Feldblum, a longtime civil rights advocate and scholar. As legislative counsel to the ACLU AIDS project in the late 1980s, Chai played a leading role in drafting and negotiating the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990. She later played the same role on the ADA Amendments Act of 2008. She also led the drafting and negotiating of the Employment Non-Discrimination Act, a bill to prohibit discrimination in employment on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity. As a law professor at Georgetown Law, Chai created a federal legislation clinic where she and her students helped nonprofit organizations advance their legislative social justice goals. The clinic's clients included various disability organizations and Catholic Charities USA. Chai also founded and directed Workplace Flexibility 2010, an effort designed to bring employers and employees together on policy approaches to advance workplace flexibility. Chai served as a commissioner of the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, or the EEOC, from 2010 to 2019, where she played a significant role in establishing the rights of LGBTQ employees under existing sex discrimination laws, enhancing the employment of people with disabilities, protecting the rights of pregnant workers, and leading a proactive effort to prevent harassment in the workplace. From 2019 to 2021, Chai was a partner and director of Workplace Culture Consulting at Morgan Lewis, where she helped employers create safe, respectful, diverse, and inclusive workplaces. She continues to consult with Morgan Lewis on selected projects. In 2021, Chai became a freelance civil rights advocate. She assists with legislative and regulatory work regarding civil rights, particularly for LGBTQ plus people, people with disabilities, and women. She also serves as vice chair of the Ability One Commission, a federal agency devoted to the employment of people with significant disabilities. Chai attended Barnard College and Harvard Law School and clerked for Judge Frank M. Coffin on the First Circuit Court of Appeals and for U.S. Supreme Court Justice Harry A. Blackmun. All right. Well, hi, hi. Thank you so much for being our guest today. We're honored to have you. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. So our listeners just heard, you know, your biography, which is just teeming with all of your amazing works and accomplishments. Um, And out of all of that, I'd love to know, you know, what is the work that you're most proud of? Um, What are you most passionate about? Well, I think what I'm most proud of is the ability to have been able to work in coalition with some amazing people over the past 35, 40 years, right? So starting 1988 to 8090, working to help enact the ADA. After the ADA enacted, working with trying to get regulations passed that were good, working with a great team in terms of the ADA Amendments Act of 2000, as a commissioner at the EOC, working to implement the ADA. So all of this is about securing basic civil rights protections for people with disabilities. I'm certainly proud to have been a part of that effort and that struggle and to have had the chance to work with some amazing people along the journey. Wow, that's wonderful. And and what can you share with our listeners about your disability and how that impacts your daily life um, or how it informs your work? Yeah, so I was diagnosed with anxiety disorder when I was 29. I'm sure I had it, obviously, my whole life. When I think back on it, I realize my mom probably had it, but she died when I was pretty young. And I sort of like, I had the panic attacks really around doing legislative amendments for people with AIDS and HIV, protecting people with AIDS and HIV that didn't come out exactly the way I wanted. And then suddenly I'm having panic attacks, which I had no clue, no clue what they were. So in a way, I got very lucky that I got diagnosed so early and I got diagnosed just when I was starting to work on the ADA in 1988. I don't think that at the time I necessarily self-identified as a member of the disability community, Mm -hmm. even with having the psychiatric disorder, even with the person helping to write a very broad definition of disability. 
that would obviously include people with depression, anxiety disorder, because as a society, we we weren't doing that. But I would say by the end of working on the ADA, and certainly afterwards, I realized how important it was to come out as a person with a psychiatric disability. Medicated since I've been 29, I'll be medicated till the day I die. You know, thank goodness for anti-anxiety and, you know, medications. And it's just been very important to me to be out about it. In terms of how it's impacted me, I have been incredibly lucky because I went to law school, didn't have the diagnosis at the time, clerked for a Supreme Court justice, an appellate court judge, and then a Supreme Court justice Again, not diagnosed. By the time I was diagnosed, I was a lawyer for the ACLU AIDS project. You could be open about anything, you know. Mm -hmm. And I was, I'm also a lesbian. And so I was open about that at the time. And then I was a law professor for 19 years and was open about being both a lesbian and having a psychiatric disorder. But I'm a tenured faculty person right? Look how much control and autonomy that is. Mm -hmm. And then I was a commissioner of the EOC. Again, incredible control and autonomy. Then a partner for two years at a law firm and now vice chair of an Ability One commission that's all about hiring people with disabilities. I got lucky in my career. But I will tell you, lots of other people with anxiety disorder or depression or any other number of psychiatric disabilities don't feel comfortable coming out and therefore don't feel comfortable asking for the accommodations that they need in order to be successful in their job. Before we get into kind of your thoughts on the ADA and your work at Ability One, um, I'd like to just know a little bit more about what does a day in your life consist of typically? I officially said a year ago that I was retired. I no longer say that because I'm clearly working part time as a special government employee as vice chair of the Ability One Commission. And I'm also doing a significant amount of volunteer work. So if I just, as well as some consulting on the side on diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. So if I think about a typical day, I just came off of a working group trying to figure out what's the fair and ethical way for employers to use artificial intelligence in employment. And so I'll be, you know, helping to write part of that report. The day before, I'm talking about racial equity and intersection with disability and LGBTQ status because I'm on the board of advisors of the RAND Center on Racial Equity. Another point of the day, I'm talking with a group about what their policy on anti-discrimination, anti-harassment, and creating a safe and respectful workplace should be. So those are all like sort of small volunteer stuff or some small paid. But then otherwise, on my Ability One work, I'm reading, I'm reading policies, regulations, statutes, I'm meeting with the career staff, I'm meeting with disability stakeholders. My work on the Ability One Commission is very similar to what I did in various policy jobs while the other work is sort of things that I choose to do to help make the work a better place without having to have one full-time job. That's great. And I'd love to know, you know, since you were, you know, one of the key people helping to draft the ADA, um, you know, can you tell us what do you see as the importance of the ADA? The ADA was groundbreaking. We all know that, right? It wasn't the first civil rights bill protecting people with disabilities. That happened in 1973 when we got Sections 501 and Sections 503 and Sections 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, which prohibited discrimination against people with disabilities under Section 504 by any entity getting federal financial assistance. Mm -hmm. So that's like hospitals and schools were the main uh, folks covered, groups covered. And then Section 503, federal contractors and 501 federal agencies. So we had that law, but we didn't have a law that said broadly to society that people with disabilities deserved civil rights, deserved not to be subjected to discrimination Mm -hmm. in private employment, in private businesses, you know, as employees, as customers, clients, et cetera. So I think the importance is probably threefold. One is the message that it sends, right? We're not talking about charity. We're talking about civil rights. 
We're not talking about pity and, oh my God, how can you possibly be a blind person and manage in this world? It's like, yeah, I manage. (laughs) And actually I could do a very good job as a blind person if I got it, right? So I think it was a very important message about the role that people with disabilities deserve to play in society. I think it had a second very practical impact in terms of physical accessibility, not anywhere where we want it to be. I think each time any of us go into a restaurant with just one step, and we know that for the last 30 years, (laughs) they should have put a ramp over that step because it's, quote, readily achievable. Mm -hmm. So it's not everything we want, but it's a lot more accessibility than we had seen, especially with new construction. So, you know, we're not needing to worry about attitudes with that accessibility where, you know, you just the the construction world needs to know about and they do. And then third, in employment, I think it has some significant effect, albeit not enough, but it has an effect in that, especially if you're already employed and you have a disability and you need an accommodation, you now can ask for that accommodation and therefore be successful in your job. Now, you need to feel safe to come out with that disability and explain the accommodation you need. You know, under the law, if you have a disability, it's making you not perform well. And then you are told, well, sorry, we have to terminate you because you are in fact not performing well. You cannot at that point say, oh, oh, but actually I have a disability. And if I had gone an accommodation, then I would be performing well. It doesn't go backwards. <laughs> it's not retroactive. But if you are able to come forward, if the workplace is safe enough and the employer makes it clear that they consider having people with disabilities part of their desire diversity, then that creates a space for people to come forward. So that's a third thing that I think ADA has been very important about. So on the flip side of that, where do you see uh, limitations in the ADA? So the limitations come when we face the attitudes of people who don't think that people with disabilities can necessarily do a job. So again, now I'm talking about employment. Mm -hmm. Because in the public accommodations, you know, people coming in as customers or clients, you know, they want your money. In employment, the hiring person has a choice among lots of people. And if you have someone who has a manifest disability, so this tends to affect people with manifest disabilities, folks who use wheelchairs, little people, um, you're deaf, blind, autism in a way that's very um, noticeable, right? Hiring folks just want to hire people that they think aren't going to cause them any trouble. And if they have three people and, you know, out of the three, two seem very qualified, but one is using a wheelchair or one is deaf, I think unless they have a reason to act otherwise, they will just somehow over and over again not hire the person Mm. who is blind or deaf, or uses a wheelchair. And let me tell you, they will never say it in a way that you can bring an ADA claim <laughs> and say it was because of this. Life doesn't happen that way. So I think the ADA is inherently limited because it is solely a non-discrimination law to move the needle on increasing employment for people with the most significant or manifest disabilities. So, you know, how is it that you think uh, we can move that needle and employ people with disabilities? Um, You know, is it some sort of incentivization for employers? You know, how can we go a step beyond the ADA? So I think the most important place is to start is culture. Mm -hmm. Again, it's, it's about attitudes. It's about not realizing that diversity in your workplace should also mean diversity of people with disabilities. Right. So it's about changing people's attitudes, of which law is really only one small piece of changing attitudes. It's an important piece of the puzzle, but it's just one. So I think the fact that the, you know, the folks who grew up with the ADA, right, ADA celebrated its 32nd anniversary a few weeks ago. 
you know, the folks who grew up with the ADA, they call themselves the ADA generation, which I completely love. Mm-hmm. They, they grew up with a different set of expectations and those expectations ripple through society. So I think that's the most important thing is the cultural change. Now, law can help. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and one of the ways is that it can create incentives as opposed to just the non-discrimination. And, you know, I mentioned in 1973, Section 501 of the Rehabilitation Act covered federal agencies. And it didn't just say you can't discriminate. It said you federal agencies have to take affirmative action to employ people with disabilities. And Section 503 said the same thing with regard to federal contractors. You have to take affirmative action. Now, the question is, what does that translate into? (laughs) And for years, certainly on EEOC side, oh, so the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, where I was a commissioner for nine years, has the legal responsibility to implement Section 501 with regard to federal agencies. And this office called Office of Federal Contract Compliance Programs, which sits within Department of Labor, they had the responsibility of implementing the 503 affirmative action requirements. EOC from the beginning was very good at collecting data from federal agencies about how many people with disabilities they were hiring, but they never issued regulations, which are much more powerful than just, you know, policy guidelines of here's the information we want you to have. The Department of Labor was not even really collecting that much information. So something that was a significant step forward in the Obama administration is that the Office of Federal Contract Compliance Programs in Department of Labor issued regulations to say to all federal contractors, we want you to have an aspirational goal. Uh, And they said an aspirational goal of having 7% people with disabilities in your workforce. Well, that's good, right? Because now the hiring manager, if that goal has, you know, trickled down to the hiring managers, now there's a reason to potentially hire the person with the disability if they're as good as the other, because that helps you reach your goal. Unfortunately, a major flaw in that, that regulation, which a lot of us said at the time, and the disability community continues to say is that the definition of disability that the Department of Labor used in that regulation was the definition of disability under the ADA as we have Congress amended it in 2008. Under that definition of disability, anyone with any medical condition is a person with a disability, right? My anxiety disorder, someone else's depression, someone's Crohn's disease, um, diabetes, irritable bowel syndrome, heart condition, they are all disabilities. And they're not really necessarily the ones that are having the biggest barriers in terms of hiring. Mm. But that's what that regulation says. Two years later, we at the EOC put out our regulation to implement Section 501, and we very carefully divided it into two groups of people with disabilities. And we had a 12% goal for people with disabilities covered under the ADA, which is like so many people, all you have to do is create a safe enough atmosphere for people to Mm self-identify. And then a 2% goal for people with what we call targeted disabilities. Literally, we had a list of people with targeted disabilities, right? Folks using wheelchairs, having significant mobility impairments, people who are deaf, people who are blind, people with significant psychiatric, you know, conditions, bipolar, Mm -hmm. little people, people with, you know, intellectual developmental disabilities. So, you know, I think we did a better job, but the limitation in both of those is enforcement. Mm -hmm. You know, I will tell you the numbers that the federal agencies have gone up on hiring people with targeted disabilities since the regulation. So I'm pleased with that. But if they haven't gone up at some agency, there's not really anything EOC can do other than publicize it, you know. And at Department of Labor, if a federal contractor doesn't meet its aspirational goal, I mean, what are they going to do? The only thing you can do is yank the contract. Mm -hmm. And they're never going to do that. (laughs) It's just not going to happen. So it's not nothing. 
It's better than the ADA because it does create aspirational goals and goals focus the mind. And I like that, but it has its limitations as well. That's interesting. Now, you you mentioned a little bit ago that you sort of pretended to retire and then kind of ended up back at Ability One Commission. And so I'd love to know a little bit more about, you know, why did you join Ability One and what do you kind of hope to accomplish during your, your uh, service there? So when I learned about Ability One, which was late, it wasn't an entity that I knew much about, I realized that Ability One had the potential to be sort of the third leg of that stool to really move the needle on hiring people with disabilities. Because Ability One was all about leveraging financial incentives, not an aspirational goal. So what does that mean? So Ability One has a history that is completely antithetical to our philosophy now in the disability community. So let me make that clear. So it's a program that has to be changed and modernized. And I always like a challenge. And so that's why I said yes, when asked to being on the commission, but it's a challenge that is worth undertaking. You know, the upside can be very high. So the Ability One Commission is this independent agency that helps facilitate about $4 billion in federal contracts those are the federal agencies, and they are what are called sole source contracts. So once an item is voted on by this commission to be on what's called a procurement list, so once that item for a product that the federal government needs or service that the federal government needs, once it's on that list, the only employer that can get that contract without having to compete with everyone else in the country is an employer that is a nonprofit agency that is primarily hiring people with disabilities. Okay, so think about the power of that. Instead of the blind person never getting in the door, here, the whole point is they want blind people to be doing this work because that's how they're getting the contract for blind people to be doing the work, Mm -hmm. right? Same thing in terms of services. So it has a lot of potential to literally completely flip the mindset of a hiring manager so that if you have a significant disability, you're out ahead of the game. You're at the front of the line in terms of getting hired. Okay. I love that. Mm-hmm. That to me is the third piece. Now, the problem is that the program began in 1938 on the assumption that blind people couldn't do anything other than make like rooms and mops. <laughs> and so that's why these contracts had to be limited to nonprofit agencies that hired blind people to make the brooms and mops. And they had to hire at least 75% people with who are blind and they could go up to 100%, right? And then it got amended in the 70s to include people with severe disabilities who are actually defined as people who could not work in normal competitive employment. I mean, it's like the essence of charity, right? You can't get a job anywhere else. So we'll figure out what are these sort of mundane contracts that you can do being janitors or in dining rooms. And we're going to make sure those contracts go only to you. Mm -hmm. And by the way, they were allowed to pay some minimum wages because they were assumed not to be productive. So there's a history of the contracts being contracts that are not very great in terms of the types of jobs they offer and segregated. So we don't want those types of jobs. But when you look at the program now, I told you $4 billion in contracts. Mm -hmm. Some of these are very sophisticated contracts. Manufacturing is very sophisticated now. There's IT services. There's, There's tons of jobs that are being paid very well. We, we just, the Ability One Commission finally issued a regulation two weeks ago saying you cannot use subminimum wages in any mm-hmm. Ability One contract, okay? That's great. 15 years ago, that might have covered, I don't know, half of the employees. Do you know how many it covers now? Out of 40,000 employees, 1,200 employees, 1,200 out of 40,000 were still being paid subminimum wage. Now, that's 1,200 too many, right. and our regulation will now fix that. But, but they're actually pretty good jobs. 
The problem is there's still all this segregation because this statute requires that segregation, you know, requires mm-hmm. that overemployment. So I always like tough challenges. And I came on to the commission together with three other commission members. The only way you do this is with the team. Like I said, what I like the most is working with the team. We're definitely having a significant strategic direction change in the program. And um, anyone who wants to read our strategic plan or even just my, I did a little medium piece on why the strategic plan is important. We are working to ensure that every job in this program has at least four components, none of which is limited by the state. It can all be done under the statute. They have to be paying competitive wages and benefits, not just minimum wage, but competitive. Mm -hmm. They have to treat their folks working as full employees covered under all employment laws. You know, they're not people receiving rehabilitation services. They might be in some other area, but when they're on that job, they're on the job, they're employees. Mm -hmm. And then two things that they wouldn't get in the private sector. So I think very positive an individual job customization conversation, like making Mm -hmm. sure they're in the right job and that they have the right supports given their disability and a person-centered employment plan. You know, so where do you want to go next? So it's the exact opposite of thinking, oh, these are people who can never really work. So let's just give them something to keep them busy. It's we're now going to require that they are engaging with these employees about where do you want to go next? What skills do you want to achieve consistent with the disability of which, you know, the options are way wider than most people have sometimes been taught to believe about themselves. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're going to do. That's our goal over the next few years. Yeah, that's wonderful work. And I appreciate learning more about that. I think that's probably an organization not enough people are aware um, is even out there. Yeah. Well, I didn't know it was out there (laughs) until I started learning about it. And when I first learned about it, all I learned was some segments of the disability community wanting to dismantle it because of its philosophical underpinnings. Mm -hmm. And I completely understood that. And completely agree, we have to move away from the philosophical underpinnings. But I sort of felt it was like cutting off that third leg of the stool because you didn't like where that leg came from, Mm. as opposed to saying, let's try to fix this leg (laughs) and then leverage this program to the max. So as a lawyer who works on civil rights, you know, I'm really curious, um, what are some of the cases that you've been involved in that you feel have been really impactful? So I have not been a litigator. I okay. haven't been a civil rights litigator. What I've been is someone who helps draft the laws mm-hmm. that then become the subject of litigation, right? So as a law professor, I taught a course that I called lawmaking, which was about legislation and regulations and how impactful those two parts of law were, even though the law students were only hearing about cases, I was trying to bring them back to like uh, Article 1 and 2 of the Constitution, (laughs) the Congress and the administration before you get to Article 3 of the courts. So I really feel the first most important thing is the legislation, ADA of the 1990, ADA Amendments Act of 2008, the regulations from the EOC. But then in terms of cases, you know, the Bragdon case, which was one of the first cases the Supreme Court decided covering people with AIDS Mm -hmm. was essential. And then the bad cases, you know, what we call the Sutton Trilogy, which was what pulled back and and really squeezed the definition of disability to something tiny, Mm -hmm. which is why we then need legislative reaction. And then the Olmstead case. You know, mm-hmm. which is the one that really established the right to integration, integration in the community, integration in jobs. I mean, that was an essential Supreme Court case. But I helped by helping to pass the legislation and the regulations and then was a, uh, you know, cheerleader for the folks bringing the cases. So, you know, I'd like to know, you know, what would you say to listeners who are feeling defeated right now, um, either because of a personal struggle or because of current events? Very relevant question (laughs) for so many of us now. So, 
You know, on the personal front, I think about, you know, within the gay community, how we have this whole thing for the youth of it gets better. Because it really is hard for youth who are LGBTQ, depending on where they're living, to actually believe it'll get better. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think certainly if you are a young person with a disability and you've seen all the obstacles, I really feel like the thing I can say is it gets better. It's not that it gets easy. It never gets easy. Um, And I think it's much easier for people who are LGBTQ now in our society at least in some states and countries than it is for people with disabilities, or at mm-hmm. least manifest disabilities. So I'm not saying it gets easy, but I think if you you reach out and try to create a community for yourself, you know, that is a plus of social media and having the web, you know, things that people with disabilities and LGBTQ people didn't necessarily have 20 years ago um, or 40 years ago when I was, you know, growing up. I'm 63 now. So, you know, it's, uh, I have definitely seen the difference. So I think what I would say in terms of personal struggles, really try to find a community and it doesn't even have to be that many people and find people who will support you in coming out Mm -hmm. at school, at jobs, in your community, because that's the way to live your full self. That's if you have a hidden disability. And if you have a manifest disability, to help you make it clear to folks that you don't want them to ignore your disability. You know, oh, I don't even notice you're in a wheelchair. Oh, well, great. Then you clearly aren't seeing me (laughs) and what I live with in my life. But I'm not only a person who uses a wheelchair or whatever the other disability is. So that's on the personal. You know, on the political front in the country, I think so many of us have just been so devastated and demoralized at realizing how much like half of our country is getting their information from places that are sort of not telling them the truth. I mean, they're not Mm -hmm. bad people at all, but, but they're not getting real information. And so they're voting for people that don't necessarily have their interests at heart or the interests of folks who are otherwise marginalized. And again, here's what I think. I mean, the disability community definitely needs to be aware that if you're disabled in LGBTQ or disabled in Black or Latinx or Asian, I mean, obviously, it just, these have their double whammies. And I think people understand that instinctively. The only thing I can say there is one changes this world by voting, by Mm -hmm. educating other people. I think that's the best we can do. Great advice. And where would you, uh, if listeners want to get in contact with you after today's episode, how can they connect with you? Sure. So I have a website, chaifeldblum.com. So it's C-H-A-I-F-E-L-D-B-L-U-M. It's all just one word, dot com. And there's a place there to send me an email and it just goes straight to my Gmail. Mm -hmm. And And I can write people back from my Gmail. I'm also very good about responding to LinkedIn. Um, requests um, or Twitter, I do. That's at Hi Feldblum. Um, I will confess that I was a major social media person, like while I was at the EOC, because I just wanted to get the word out mm-hmm. about EOC. And then I cut it all out when I was at a partner for two years at a law firm. And so I'm slowly trying to get back in. So you can get to me through my website and encourage me to get back on Twitter (laughs) and Facebook more often. Well, is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners or anything that we didn't ask that we should have? I think what I want to share is that things like the ADA centers are really fantastic. I mean, I know a number of them. I think this is all part of finding a community and it may be starting through an ADA center or maybe starting through an independent living center I was talking to someone else on a podcast and she said, this isn't just a podcast, it's a movement. (laughs) And that made sense to me, right? Podcasts and other events are really all part of a movement. And, you know, to end with where I started, a movement is about moving with other people and don't ever feel you should be doing this on your own. It's not fun and it's not as effective. (laughs) So (laughs) 
find the compatriots. Well, thank you so much for your time today. You are very welcome. And thank you for all of your work. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Adventures in Accessibility. Tune in next time for another dive into the unknown. Adventures in Accessibility is hosted by Emily Schumann and Jessica Lucinia is our sound engineer. This podcast is a project of the Rocky Mountain ADA Center and is funded under a grant from the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living, and Rehabilitation Research. Grant number 90DPAD0009-01-00. This production is intended solely for entertainment and informal guidance and should not be considered legal advice. The opinions expressed by guests are not necessarily held or endorsed by the Rocky Mountain ADA Center.